this is Russell Moore, and you're listening to The Russell Moore Show, brought to you by Christianity Today. Every week, we explore here conversations and questions from a Christian perspective to help you sort out how to live as a follower of Jesus in confusing times. And this week, we have a conversation to seek to do just that. You know, every once in a while here on The Russell Moore Show, we do something I call Tell Me Where I'm Wrong. It's been a minute since we've done this. Uh, and today is kind of one of those. Uh, not really, uh, because I, I want to talk with our guest about a, a whole uh, variety of things. It won't be completely uh, his telling me where I'm wrong. And you'll you'll kind of see uh, how that goes. So it's kind of a hybrid uh, show today about the Roman Catholic Church and about uh, what's happening in the intersection of not just Catholicism, but uh, religion in general with American culture and world culture. And so the rules, if if you will remember, for those of you who, for whom this is the first, tell me where I'm wrong, uh, is that at least when we're talking about where I'm wrong, I'm not allowed to argue. Uh, I'm only allowed to ask questions to understand uh, the guest point of view. And if I start to argue, which I have done and, and can make it sound like a question, the guest is supposed to call me out on that. So that's the uh, that's the ground rules for it. And today, I'm really thrilled to have New York Times columnist Ross Douthat uh, with us today, who's the author of several books. Uh, I really liked his book, Bad Religion, of uh, several years ago, uh, and also his, his uh, newest uh, book, The Deep Places, a memoir of illness and discovery. And we're going to talk a little bit about that as well in this wide-ranging conversation. Ross Douthat, thanks for being with us today. It's it's a pleasure to be here, Russell. And I've brought, you know, several members of the Spanish Inquisition, um, you know, for just for just for this opportunity to. Okay. To... Well, I'll keep my guard up then. Uh, you know, I remember one time. Uh, I think this would have been around 2015. There was some sort of an event uh, in Washington, and you and I were talking. Uh, about Pope Francis and something controversial was going on with Pope Francis at the moment. I don't remember what it was. And there was uh, an evangelical that we both know who stopped by and said, oh, we've got the Catholic and the evangelical. They're over here arguing. And I said, yeah, we're arguing about Pope Francis, but I'm taking his side. And it was it was this odd situation where the evangelical was kind of standing up for the Pope in whatever that conversation was. That's that's kind of, I think, an indication of how different these times seem to be when it comes to uh, religious identity. Everything seems to be sort of shaken up. And I'd love to hear from you as someone who grew up, um, if I remember right, at least in your teenage years, in a more charismatic Pentecostal evangelical setting. Yep. How did you uh, how did you transition from that? Uh, into the Roman Catholic Church, and especially as opposed to just secularizing. So, I don't want to, you know, it's it's sort of a longish story. I'll try and truncate it. But basically, I was baptized Episcopalian. Um, I grew up in Southern Connecticut, uh, and were my parents were sort of whatever a conventional mainline Protestant would be in the 1980s, that was what they were. I think my father's parents had moved back and forth between Methodist and Presbyterian churches without having strong theological views at any point during during the move back and forth. My mother had been raised in the Episcopal Church, had a sort of Catholic, Catholic grandparent somewhere. Um, and I think there's a version of our family's life story where we would have sort of followed what's often been a pretty a well-trodden mainline protestant path to secularization um i don't know exactly what form that would have taken uh, but you know sociologically we were sort of ripe ripe for secularization you could say my parents were ivy league educated they were you know my, they were sort of living in a the liberal a liberal part of the country and so on but when i was about six or seven years old my mother who had various sort of strange allergies and 
uh, sort of mysterious illnesses, inflammations, and so on. She tried a lot of things for those, but one thing she did was accept an invitation from a friend to attend a healing service. This woman who had a essentially a charismatic healing ministry that met in high school auditoriums all over Connecticut and New England, which I've always wondered about the church state issues raised mm-hmm. by those services, because they were definitely public, public high schools. Um, but uh, and it was, you know, it was sort of there was Christian Christian praise music, um, and the woman would go around and and point to people in the audience and identify their maladies and pray for them, and people would fall down. They would be sort of slain in the spirit, in the in the language in the language of that part of Christianity, and this happened much to her surprise. Um, to my mother and listeners who are really interested in this story can. Google her name, Patricia Snow. Uh, she's written a bit about her own experiences for the magazine First Things. But basically, from my perspective, we were sort of pulled out of a kind of conventional, declining, arid form of Christianity into a very intense, sort of supernaturally um, vibrant and vibrating um, experience. And I, I didn't personally have these kind of you know, these sort of intense experiences of the Holy Spirit. Um, But I was around people who did, including the secular people who came with my parents sometimes to these services and had these experiences and sometimes just clearly didn't know how to process them. Um, But that was sort of my my background going into my teenage years. And it, it was a background where, you know, we sort of moved back and forth between, you know, I went to secular liberal leaning private schools. We were in the sort of conventional secular liberal environment. But then on weekends, I went and saw my parents speak in tongues. So the idea of sort of balancing those two realities was always, I think, part of my background and upbringing and experience. And I never really and still don't, you know, had a, I, I never had a strong skepticism about those experiences. I wouldn't be able to you know, prove to you that they absolutely were the third person of the Holy Trinity at work in those high school auditoriums. But they were certainly real in a way that is not captured by, you know, the cliche of the preacher pushing, you know, putting his hands on someone and pushing them down or the just the sort of idea that it's just people being caught up in enthusiasm. They felt supernaturally real. And that 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 experience certainly stamped me going forward, I think. Mm hmm. And, and what uh, caused the turn from that to Roman Catholicism? Well, Opus Dei sent an albino monk to kidnap my family, <laughs> and they were held in a Vatican dungeon for some time. No, I mean, the turn, so there was, for my mother and my parents, there were a series of somewhat negative experiences with um, people who were starting to, f- trying to found actually an evangelical church at Yale that sort of fell apart with a lot of recrimination and unhappiness. Um, and at that time, uh, my mother had become friendly with people who went to a Catholic charismatic retreat center. Um, mm-hmm. There's obviously a charismatic movement of sorts within, within and around the Catholic Church. Amy Coney Barrett has some background in you know one one part of it, and so that was sort of a bridge. But then there were also just ways I think in which. When my mother writes about it, she would say that you know she was both intellectually and mystically drawn into. Catholicism. She had a background as an Episcopalian. There was already a sort of comfort with acceptance of the sort of structures of, um, you know, old fashioned institutional Christianity, really old fashioned. (laughs) Um, And for me, you know, I, I, for me, it was fairly conventional. I read C.S. Lewis and then I read G.K. Chesterton and other Catholic apologists Since I wasn't having the mystical experiences myself, it was a much more intellectual process. I liked Catholic architecture and sort of Catholic tradition and the sense of sort of historic connection to to the ancient church. I found generally the arguments that Catholic writers made convincing. I was 17 or 18 at the time. Um, But so I, it was a sort of a fairly smooth transition for me in spite of obviously the very striking difference between Mm -hmm. (laughs) high church Roman Catholicism and, you know, seeing your parents speaking in tongues in a high school auditorium. It was smoother than that contrast would suggest, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I, I, I grew up with my mother's side of the family Catholic, my father's side of the family evangelical, uh, Southern Baptist. Uh, and so I think that kept me from being anti-Catholic. Uh, because I, I could see all of the great things about my Catholic side of the family and in a majority Catholic area. It also, I think, probably prevented me from moving in a direction that some of my friends did toward actually becoming Roman Catholic. Because what I saw with some of them, not all of them, but with some of them, was this kind of idea that joining the church would be joining a church full of Walker Percy's and Flannery O'Connor's and they, they had the intellectual sort of uh, a sort of experience and then were hit with the reality that, that there is no safe harbor from fighting and division and all of those sorts of things. Was, was, was the difference between ideal and real trouble for you or was this something easy for you to acclimate toward? So I came into the church in the late 1990s, which was probably a very good time to make that transition in the sense that John Paul II had been Pope for a long time. He was in decline, but still had some of his powers. There was a sense, there was sort of a world of conservative Catholicism at that point that, you know, wasn't all, wasn't all Walker Percy's, but you had the sense, or they had the sense that, you know, the, the church had sort of passed through this period of trouble in the 1960s and 1970s, and that then John Paul II had clarified effectively that the church still taught the important things that it had always taught, and that, you know, at least in their parts of the church, and we attended, you know, a Dominican, a parish run by the Dominican order uh, that, you know, was not traditionalist in the sense of doing the Latin mass or anything, but was certainly reverent and and serious in, in its liturgies and orthodox in its theology. So in that sort of particular world and in the intellectual world associated with it, it felt like American Catholicism, Western Catholicism had sort of been th been through a trauma, come out successfully on the other side, and the future looked reasonably bright. Now, I went away to college as a Catholic. I won't say that, you know, college was a peak in any way of my <laughs> practice of the faith. I, I did mostly drag myself to mass on Sundays. Um, but, you know, there was sort of a declension that then, and then the sex abuse crisis hit. Um, as why, in fact, I was at Harvard, so it was while I was in Boston uh, that the first the first revelations came out. And so, within five years of becoming Catholic, I was confronted in certain ways with sort of the worst of what can what can go wrong in any Christian institution. But there are sort of particular problems of hierarchy that you know attended attended the way the sex abuse crisis manifested. It, it it's you know, you obviously have your own experiences with with predation and sex abuse in the Southern Baptist world. But, you know, wherever sex abuse manifests itself, it sort of fastens on weaknesses in the structure, mm -hmm. right? And you could see the weaknesses and corruptions of hierarchy in play in Catholicism. And so very early on, I think I had to come to grips with, you know, I had sort of a honeymoon period and then had to come to grips with, you know, the the reality that you always know intellectually, right? If you join the Catholic Church, you're saying, well, I'm, you know, I'm signing up for for a papacy that, you know, had some bad moments, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Some bad centuries even here and there, right? But so, the, the, yeah, that was a very visceral confrontation. Um, and to the extent that it was possible to sort of dislodge me from Catholicism, maybe that would have been the point. But it wasn't really, I never sort of felt like there was another obvious place to go. I had a fairly firm Christian faith. I felt like, you know, I, I had once once you sort of committed yourself to, you know, some of the things that Southern Baptists would emphatically not commit themselves to. Once you've made that commitment, then if you're going to leave, it's like, well, you know, you can go become Eastern Orthodox. And mm -hmm. obviously, you know, you and I both know people who yeah. have made that made that transition. But my view was always, you know, even even if you thought the Russian Orthodox Church had slightly superior theology, and we won't even get into the condition of Russian Orthodoxy at the mm -hmm. moment. I'm an American. I'm a I'm a Westerner, right? The even from an Orthodox perspective, the Pope is the patriarch of the West. Like even you know even if you were so disillusioned, it still felt like this was you know this was the place you were gonna you were gonna sort of stay and 
stay and fight for no matter what. I don't know how long it's been since you've read 95 Theses by Martin Luther, but <laughs> as, as you sort of reflect on that, uh, with the issue of the selling of indulgences and the question of how does a person become right with God, did Luther have a point or, or was he just confusing some momentary corruption with what's real in your view? I mean, I would say that the church itself has tacitly conceded. That, well, the, the church has certainly conceded that Luther and other reformers had a point about corruption, right? As I mean, I don't think anyone would deny that the reformers had a point about the moral condition of parts of parts of the hierarchy in the 15th and 16th century. And obviously, you know, the church had fairly recently lived through the Great Schism. Um, so any, anyone at that point who thought, you know, he, the entire Counter-Reformation in its attempt to sort of restructure, reorganize and remoralize Catholicism was already a concession that the reformers were, you know, had sort of some reasonable objections. I think on the theological questions about um, grace, grace and works, there's been a kind of, you know, this project has fallen fallen a bit by the wayside. But there's been in the in the ecumenical climate a certain convergence, right, in um, in uh, theological views of you know how grace and works fit together that makes you think looking back um you know that that there were places where at the very least lutherans and catholics could have could have held together uh more than they did calvinism is a sort of somewhat somewhat separate question i mean i think in my my own view not being an intense theologian i find that the my my sweeping generalization would be that to the extent there's a big Lutheran Catholic divide, I think the Pauline epistles lean more Lutheran, but I still think the gospels lean a little more works based righteousness. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, you know, if I were going to have a long argument with a Lutheran or certainly a Calvinist friend, I, I feel like I would end up, you know, quoting 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 gospel passages against them more than Pauline passages against them. But my basic view of a bunch of those questions is that, um, you know, what what I think of as Christian orthodoxy is trying to hold certain ideas in tension. Mm -hmm. And you could say that, you know, at some moments, the pre-Reformation church lost that tension by overemphasizing works. But my sort of running critique of um, of the reformers would be that effectively they lost some of that synthesis in the other direction. Do you, do you think that the typical faithful Catholic uh, believer has a sense of fear? Am I, am I uh, acceptable to God? Am I going to purgatory? Those sorts of existential questions. It, do, are you able to work through those in a satisfactory way? I, I would say that fr from my own, just from my my own perspective, I find the sacramental emphasis of Catholicism incredibly reassuring. And I, my main, my main problems are f failing to go to confession yeah. often enough. Um, I'm not relative, relative to other Catholics I know who have my set of theological commitments. I'm a somewhat less pious personality. And I think some of that is this sort of an odd result of having been attached to someone else's conversion story. Like my mm. conversion story is sort of a subset of my parents and especially my mother's. And my mother is, you know, there's a variation in how religious different personalities are. My mother is a more religious personality than I am. Absent her arc, would I have ended up Catholic in, or in, in the same way, you know, who knows? It's all right, all part of God's providence. But because of that, I've sort of ended up somewhere that I'm, you know, not completely temperamentally suited for sometimes. And so I, but but what that means in turn is that my anxieties are about being bad at it. That you know, we had we had the 
we had terrible flu before Christmas and um, I didn't take, you know, I usually take my kids to confession during Advent and we didn't do it. And then we've had a death in the family and colds and we, you know, we haven't been to confession on whatever, you know, whatever the time schedule I try to keep is keep with my kids. Right. And I know that, you know, somewhere out there, there's the more zealous Catholic who's, you know, no, no flu, no cold, no, you know, nothing, nothing is, mm-hmm. is having them miss, miss um, the sacrament if they're conscious of any, of any kind of sin. So that's that's more the source of my of of any sort of internal to Catholicism anxieties and a feeling of like when I leave the confessional and anxiety about whether I'm actually actually right with God. I, I don't relate well, I think, to what Luther felt, that sort of abyss of uncertainty about about his own his own justification. When you think about authority. Uh, and and the structure of the church. I suppose that my question is: first of all, do you, do you think that it's possible for a church to lose its lampstand, the presence of, of Christ, including including the Roman Church? Is that possible, um, or or is your view that that could happen but never would because of the guidance of the Holy Spirit? Yeah, my my view is that it's not possible for the Roman Church to lose its lampstand, um, and that's that that's the that that is sort of what is what is promised in you know the scriptural words that we we have written around our you know our big tent in Rome um, on this rock I will build this the church and everything else. Now that has that belief has to coexist with an acknowledgement. Uh, you know, of what we've been talking about, sort of recurring corruption and failure and everything else that shows up throughout Catholic history. Um, so it certainly is the case that the lampstand can become, the light can become very, very obscure at at different times. Um, and I think you have to say that, you know, Catholicism, especially since the 60s, has opened up a, you know, an ongoing unresolved debate about, you know, just just how much of what the church teaches at any given moment you should have full confidence in, right? You can't undergo mm-hmm. a change like what the church went through at Vatican II without, you know, having having some kind of shift in your confidence about, you know, the hierarchy of the different claims that the church makes makes about itself. And a lot of the arguments within Catholicism are about that question, sort of after the changes of the 60s, after sort of larger changes with modernity, what is the absolutely reliable part of Catholic teaching and what is mutable, malleable, and up for debate? That's, you know, the whole liberal conservative divide and within Catholicism is is based around that question um, and all the debates that have sort of reopened in, in the Pope Francis era. Um, but But yes, I think... I think the Church of Rome is the church against which the gates of hell do not prevail. Now, though that does that guarantee does not apply to the Catholic Church in the state of Connecticut, <laughs> for instance. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it seems to me, and tell me if I if I'm wrong here. It seems to me, just based on reading your writings over the the years, that your approach to, for instance, Vatican II. Uh, is that Vatican II, uh, the spirit of Vatican II, uh, so-called, caused a lot of problems within the church, but not that Vatican II itself was uh, a a problem. You you would see that as a legitimate outworking of uh, God's presence in the church, just with some implications that went awry? No, I I mean, I think I've become a little more critical than that. I think think you have to say... put it this way i don't think that i don't think that the the substance of vatican ii the you know documents and teachings immediately associated with the council um were in any were you know false or wrong or any or anything like that heretical um and i think there were things that vatican ii did especially around the church's relationship to to the Jews, for instance, that were absolutely, absolutely necessary and clearly were, you know, to the extent that you see the outworking of the Holy Spirit, that that has to be it. Um, but at the same time, I, I think you have to say that the 
goals of Vatican II, if, you know, councils are called for a reason, right? And if you go back to the Reformation era, there was a council just before the 95 <laughs> Theses, um, mm-hmm. one of the Lateran councils, and then there was the Council of Trent. And if you look back, you have to say, well, you know, Trent was a success in so far as, um, you know, the church became less corrupt and more missionary and you know even if it didn't if it even if it didn't reclaim all of Europe for Catholicism it um, you know sort of it sort of re- reestablished uh, Catholic seriousness and enabled the church to compete for souls effectively across many hundreds of years the council that preceded Luther, 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 and the ninety-five thesis. You can't, you can't look back and say, well, that was a huge success, right? Because it wasn't. Um, I, I mean, I think you have to say something similar at this point about Vatican II. You can't have an ecumenical council whose official purpose is to prepare the church for a new age of evangelization in the modern world that is then immediately succeeded by a fifty-year collapse of Catholic practice in what were the core heartlands of the Catholic faith and say, well, this was a big, this was a big success. You, you just can't say that, right? And I, I think Vatican II was necessary, I guess is how I'd put it, but it was not successful, if that, mm. if that, if that line makes sense. Do you think with, uh, with Pope Francis and, and many of the changes being made, do you see the Catholic Church on a similar trajectory as the Connecticut Episcopal Church uh, from which your parents came, the, the mainline sort of absorption into the ambient culture, is, is that where you think things are, are going in the West? I think that's where things are going for certain parts of the church, certainly. Um, the, ch- the, the most liberal branches of Catholicism, the German church, especially other, other churches in Northern Europe, it's hard to look at their theology and their numerical condition and not see them as equivalents to, um, you know, the Episcopal churches in New York City that have huge endowments mm. and, you know, and nobody and nobody's there. And there's no prospect for, um, you know, there's no there's no obvious path to renewal from there. I mean, I think the one distinction in Catholic within Catholicism is that. Because of the nature of the church, the center, Rome, the Vatican, um, is such a prize. Like to be able to sort of have the power of the papacy, you know, limited and, <laughs> and mm-hmm. hampered as it is, is such a prize that it's it it does it 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 makes certain kinds of schism and division less likely just institutionally independent of theological questions than they have been for global Anglicanism or to some extent Methodists and other other denominations that have faced either schism or, or the threat of schism, right? And so, you know, it's hard for for liberal Catholics, for instance, to, you know, to leave the church when they have a sense that, well, if we, you know, if we just sort of keep fighting at some point, we'll control the papacy, right? And, and mm-hmm. I mean, to some extent, they do. It's sort of, you can debate this, right, under under Francis, but certainly more liberal parts of Catholicism are more or more empowered. And then conservative Catholics have stronger theological reasons not to go into schism. Um, but they, but they too have that sense of like, well, you know, we're always one Holy Spirit guided papal election away from sort of from, from reclaiming, reclaiming that authority. But I mean, what Francis has done is just both by encouraging the liberal party in the church and by sort of just widening the space for, again, mostly liberal forms of experimentation. He's been pretty harsh on the traditionalists. He's just created a dynamic where the gap between different portions of Catholicism can get very wide indeed. And there does seem to be a point at which it's hard, it gets hard to to stay together. I mean, I, my assumption is that at some point, there will be another, a Vatican III, another ecumenical council. Um, but how you get there and what would happen there is very, very hard to actually imagine. I was rereading the other day Michael Novak's Confessions of a Catholic uh, and, and was surprised. I don't guess I had noticed it years ago when I read it the first time. Uh, 
uh, that he disagreed with Humanae Vitae, the, the church's stance on contraception. But the, the way that he talked about that was so nuanced and qualified, which was, I, I don't agree with the decision the church made, but I'm not a dissenter. Uh, that, that means I, I, I think the church will ultimately correct on this. And so th- there is no need to um, there, there's no need to become a dissenter in that way. W- would you? I mean, not on the contraception issue, obviously, but but just generally, do you think his approach was right? Well, I mean, one, I should say, I, I think he wrote that book in the 1980s, and he yes. may, he yes. may have he may right. have right. changed yes. his own mind yes. <laughs> subsequently yes. on that question, as as some as some people did. You, you don't want to assume that you have you personally in your you know my case forty three years of life have outthought the mm-hmm. church's the church's magisterium right um, at the same time though there is I think in the disruption that um, Vatican II especially but again the whole arc of modernity is created in in the life of the church there's sort of you know there are arguments that are just open. Um, and sometimes I think conservative Catholicism in the John Paul II era got too confident that like, well, you know, we've got the Pope on our side now, so we can just invoke his authority, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but guess what? You know, two papal elections later, you don't have the Pope on your side. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can't just invoke invoke his authority on certain questions. What that means is that when I when I write, I wrote a whole book about Pope Francis that was maybe inappropriately critical of him. But the center of that debate was, the center of that book was arguments about divorce and remarriage in Catholic mm-hmm. teaching. And I tried very hard to just make an argument for why I thought the church's traditional teaching was compatible, was most compatible with the New Testament and with what Jesus said and what the early church said and so on, without saying, and by the way, Pope John Paul II ruled authoritatively on this, right? I just sort of tried to keep it to an argument uh, on the merits. But then you got, you know, I had critics, liberal Catholic critics who said that, well, you sound like a Protestant. You know, you're arguing mm-hmm. arguing from from scripture. The important thing is what the Pope says now, <laughs> right? That's, <laughs> you know, so it, it's, it's anyway, all of which is to say it's a very, um, un- it's, yeah, it's, it's sort Did of an unusual Did you say here I stand, moment. I can do no other? I never, no, I, I never say, <laughs> I never say that. There's, there's some, <laughs> You know, the, yeah, there's some presumption there, I, I think. <laughs> you know, uh, 20 years ago, uh, I would find myself looking back at 20th century uh, Baptist writings about religious liberty. And they were always focused on the threat of the Roman Catholic Church and the looming authoritarianism of uh, the Catholic Church with Al Smith or J- the JFK yep. presidential election or, or so forth. And it was always uh, the, the minute that they actually have power, the authoritarianism will come back. And I, I would laugh at some of these and dismiss them. And then I, I turn around and there's, there's this movement of Catholic integralism that at least in some sectors of it uh, sounds as though it were written by some of these uh, some of these 20th century uh, Baptists um, as a, a caricature of what Catholicism could be. It, it, are, are these sorts of uh, movements not just against the excesses of liberal democracy, but um, essentially for a, a substantive union between church and state in, in many ways? Is, is this just a momentary sort of blip of something that's happening in the larger culture and the ripples go out uh, into the church? Or is this something something more? Well, I think it's something, it's probably something more enduring in the sense that it reflects a, it reflects one possible response to what I think is a deepening alienation of um liberal societies from Christianity and vice versa, right? Mm-hmm. So when you were, when the younger Russell Moore was reading those those documents and sort of laughing at their paranoia, Catholics, including conservative Catholics, felt like, you know, they'd sort of, the church had come around 
to the view that there was a, you know, a basic and plausible compatibility manifest in the United States of America, especially between liberal norms around religious liberty and religious freedom and sort of the liberty and flourishing of Christian churches and the, and the Catholic church. Um, and I think as we go deeper into the decline of Christian practice and belief, it's, you know, that, 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 that sort of optimism has inevitably faded to some, to some degree. Um, you know, I, my, I mean, my, my basic view is that, you know, you mentioned earlier, my book from 12 years, 10 years ago, bad religion, how we became a nation of heretics. The argument in that book was that the Western world and the U S should be understood primarily as sort of dominated by heretical forms of Christianity, but not yet post-Christian. Mm. I still think that's true, but I think we're more post-Christian today than we were 10 years ago and could be more so in 30 years. And th in that kind of landscape, it shouldn't be surprising at all that, um, you know, you have equivalents of this on the Protestant side, but that some Catholic intellectuals would say, well, maybe the 19th century popes were right about their critiques of mm -hmm. liberalism, liberal democracy, and so on. And if they were right, then we need to reassess, um, you know, re reassess our general acceptance of religious liberty and religious pluralism. Yeah, I wouldn't worry about the, the actual taking of power. Uh, you're, you're right. But, but what I would worry about is the loss of a certain kind of consensus that Roman Catholics and Latter-day Saints and evangelicals and, and others had of the sort of public square where we can have our theological debates, but we're not going to uh, even aspire to impose uh, our viewpoints on one another by force, by government force. It, it does worry me if, if that is lost from the Catholic side. Yeah, I mean, I don't think, I, I think in in terms of, I think the realities of practical politics in a secularizing society are such that those groups are going to end up forced into friendship and alliance, no matter what some of their intellectuals are saying. And I think if you, you know, I think if you look at the arc of at least some of the sort of self-described integralists, you get this sort of retreat into the theoretical where they say, mm -hmm. well, actually, you know, the, form, the, the old teaching was right, and we should have a confessional state. And then you say, okay, well, what does that mean for practical politics? And they're like, well, you know, we should restore blue laws. And it's like, well, who are your allies going to be for restoring blue laws? It's going to be the Baptists, right? <laughs> I, I think there is a psychological temptation in this kind of, uh, th that you see in some people where it's like, you're trying to prove, you know, you're the toughest hombre on the block. You're mm -hmm. going to defend the inquisition, right? You see, right. you see that in internet debates, certainly. Yeah. Um, but the more, at least for now, the more people who hold those ideas move back towards practical politics, the more likely they are to essentially just recreate evangelicals and Catholics together, there's going to be some gap between religious conservatives and religious libertarians that I, I think is going to be an enduring feature of our debates. You wrote in your uh, latest book, uh, The Deep Places, about uh, a battle with uh, illness. I, I remember talking with you at a conference in, maybe this was 2015 or 2016, and you were not feeling well, but didn't really know what was what was going on. And then the book traces out that discovery of, uh, of what was what was actually happening. Did that experience with illness and mortality, how did that affect the way that you see faith and life and, and, and the world? So I mean, I think it and did a lot of things, obviously. That was Nashville, right? I think we were. Yeah, yeah. I think we were in Nashville. Yeah, that was the phase yeah. where I was. I I I think I was telling people I was having a nervous breakdown because that was sort of the consensus of the doctors at the time, um, and it turned out to be a chronic infection that I spent a long time, uh, mostly getting better from. I mean, I think in terms of some of these political and theological debates. Um, if I go and look at the arc of my writing over that period, 
I think the sickness made me first much, much angrier and more pugilistic. And then as I got better, a little bit more ironically detached. Um, and there's temptations in both things. But like if you, if you, if you look at, you know, I was anti-Trump and anti Pope Francis, which was an unusual combination. Mm -hmm. And if you look at my anti-Trump writings in 2016, um, they are, you know, as vehement as anybody's, right? Um, just sort of, you know, and, and if, but then if you look at sort of the way I engaged with intra-Catholic debates, very, very vehement, um, and maybe especially on Twitter, as such things tend to be. And then, you know, you get somewhat better until so the, the illness becomes not this immediate pain in your body all the time, but sort of a testament to, um, you know, the mysteries and complexities of the journey through human life and the extent to which you can think you're doing everything right. And then God has some spate of hopefully spiritually healthy suffering in store for you. Um, and yeah, out, out of that, I, I definitely became a little bit more detached from the incredible urgency with which people debate issues um in our in our internet age and you know again maybe to a fault i now have never trump friends or former never trump friends who think that you know i've i'm way too i'm way too easy on the republican party or on trump supporters you're, even you're though way I, too easy on the republican party <laughs> go, go ahead I'm sorry. right well there yeah, yeah. <laughs> i won't call foul on you on you so right so so here here we are and <laughs> And yeah, and, and that may be so, but to the extent, but I, I've also, you know, I still write critically about, you know, Pope Francis and theological and moral issues. I, I, I don't think I've lost my, my edge on, on every front, but I, I think I come to some of those issues with a little more sense of sort of, well, man proposes, but God disposes, right? Mm -hmm. And in the, in the end, whatever is going to happen in American politics is not in my hands. You know, it's certainly, certainly the whole Trump era teaches you the insufficiency of punditry as any kind of influence on, yeah. on American life. And you just have to have that somewhere in your mind as, as you, as you write, as you write about politics. Um, and, and also you have to recognize that, you know, people, People go through tremendous things that are hidden from from your mm -hmm. sight, um, which is and you know as I, I started writing about the illness, I guess six years into it, right? I published the book six and a half years into it, but I had you know five five or six years where this was a central part of my life, and I wrote two columns a week and never mentioned it. Mm -hmm. um, and that that reality, I think, has to shape sort of how you think about your political rivals and enemies and friends and so on, right? That sort of yeah. the burdens of an ordinary human life um, are intense in a way that isn't necessarily captured in the persona that people put forward that you end up engaging yeah. with online. Um, so those were yeah, and that's that's something I, that's true, not just at the debating issues level, but right down to neighbors and person next to you in the grocery store parking lot. Um, that is a hard lesson to learn. That there, there are secret, secret burdens being, being carried by people all around. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about before I let you go, you, you wrote recently about uh, this issue of euthanasia in Canada. Really compelling column, I think, about um, the sort of... Um, pseudo compassion that comes with the arguments for uh, for the kind of euthanasia being practiced uh, in Canada and where that leads uh, where do you think do, do you think that this is something that American life we have the resources internally not to go in that direction of sort of a, an almost a, a pressure of um, of those who are suffering, uh, get get out of the way. Don't be don't be a burden on everyone else. Go ahead and make a make a contract to die. Is American exceptionalism enough to keep us from going in that direction, or not? I mean, I think it it has. So one, obviously, versions of euthanasia are legal in some U.S. states. Um, they have been kept within limits, even in the most liberal states. One of the striking points of comparison between, say, Canada and California is that liberal California, 
has euthanasia laws with certain restrictions and the death rate from euthanasia is, I think, something like 10 times lower under California's program than Canada's, right? So even there, the most liberal U.S. state with an assisted suicide program still has not opened the door as widely as our neighbors to the north have done. Um, so I think you have to say, all right, just looking at the U.S., there are, yeah, there are clear resistance for sort of resistant forces within within American society. Um, and I think they are connected to the relative to many other Western countries, the resilience of sort of Christian assumptions in the U.S., that there is a Christianity creates a predisposition, a taboo against suicide. And as Christianity wanes, that taboo wanes with it. And it has waned. It has not waned as far in our society as it has in other societies. And that influences even our more liberal states as well as our conservative ones. Um, and, you know, and our, I mean, Canada came to the, this, euthanasia came to Canada through the Supreme Court. Um, and obviously it's not going to come to the U.S. through our Supreme Court um, any anytime soon. And, but even when there was a stronger liberal presence on the Supreme Court, there was a sense, I think, that the experience of Roe v. Wade made even liberal justices on the U.S. Supreme Court hesitant, which is why the ruling against a right to euthanasia was, um, I'm, it was basically, it may have just been unanimous 20, 20, odd, 20 odd years ago. Um, so that, you know, that, that difference is there. And this, but this gets to, you know, this, yeah, this this question of how also how those of us who are Christian and anti-Trump and unhappy with where large parts of conservatism have ended up should relate to both liberalism and conservatism right now, um, because I think you have to say that, you know, the 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 toxicity of big parts of American conservatism and Christianity are real. But I'm also still you know, if I look at an issue like euthanasia, I'm grateful for the resilience of American Christianity, even in its corrupted aspects, because I'd rather have a corrupted Christianity than, um, you know, than the Canadian euthanasia program or the Belgian euthanasia program or the Swiss, the Swiss euthanasia program. So it gives me issues like that. And I think there's a range of issues like that are what keep me attached to some kind of conservatism even in my alienation from its Trumpist manifestations. Ross Douthat, thanks for being with me today. You're very welcome. Thank you for being so patient. Thanks for listening. Links are always in the show notes for resources mentioned in this episode, including a link about how you can have a trial membership to Christianity Today. Be sure to subscribe to the program, send, a, send an episode along to a friend who might benefit from it, and leave us a review when you can. It helps other people to find the show wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm Russell Moore, and this is The Russell Moore Show from Christianity Today. The Russell Moore Show is a production of Christianity Today. Executive producers are Eric Petrick, Russell Moore, and Mike Cosper. Hosted by Russell Moore. Produced by Ashley Hales. Associate producers Abby Perry and Azare Phelps. CT administration provided by Christine Kolb. Social media by Kate Lucky. Director of operations for CT Media is Matt Stevens. Production assistance provided by Core Media. Audio engineer is Kevin Duthu. Coordinator is Beth Grabencourt. Video producer is John Rowland. The theme song for The Russell Moore Show is Dusty Delta Day by Lennon Hutton. 